one of the things that we can be grateful to these students for is their excellent taste when it came to selecting commencement speakers. And, and this morning, we're, we're all the better for it. Our, our keynote uh, is David Carr, who's not only the lead media writer for the New York Times, uh, that's, that would be my description. I don't know whether they call him that. Uh, he certainly would not. Um, and as of recently, the Andrew Lack Professor of Media Studies at Boston University. Um, David joined the Times in 2002. He had served nine years as editor of Washington, D.C.'s city paper. Uh, and he had then left to join an online startup in New York in early 2000, which he prophesied as having a brilliant future and which lasted about a year. Um, still, to many of us, his hiring at the Times was an indication that the gray lady was determined to have a serious voice in coverage of popular culture, which was an area they had never really done a whole lot with in the past. Uh, it was an amazing move by both the Times and by David. Uh, he was not a Times person. There's no ivy on David. David was a recovering coke addict from the upper Midwest who had spent most of his career with his remaining brain cells working in alternative papers and had a reputation for tough, scrupulous reporting and a flair for lucid, lucid and at times incendiary prose. And he has been an extraordinary success. David Carr is the dean of US media writers at a time when we've got more good ones than ever before. He is, in my view, our most consistently interesting, insightful, and eloquent observer of the contemporary media scene. He chronicles, indeed, he embodies basic changes in the journalism world. He blogs, he tweets, he writes columns, he makes trouble. He offers keen analysis, he legs stories as thoroughly as a journeyman reporter. Some weeks ago, and he has an enormous following, some weeks ago when I did a column I thought was pretty good, I emailed David, he tweeted it, and the next thing I knew, servers were crashing. He's a smart analyst, a terrific writer. He handles personalities, industrial rivalries, and even the intricacies of technologies that haven't finished being born with eloquence and clarity. As for higher ed, he's a University of Minnesota graduate, I think, or as he described his education in a 2011 interview, I went to two undistinguished land-grant universities in the seven short years it took me to graduate. David describes his early years in a 2008 book, The Night of the Gun, described as a memoir of addiction and, rec and recovery, in which he went back, put on his reporter's hat, and fact-checked his own blurry memories of a dark and painful past. All in all, it was an unlikely preparation for the most distinguished newspaper in the world. In a 2011 interview, in an interview conducted by Aaron Sorkin, the Oscar-winning playwright and the creator of West Wing and the HBO series Newsroom, is testimony to David's star wattage that they send Aaron Sorkin to interview him. So as David told Sorkin in this interview, prior to joining the Times, I'd always made a living being a little sassier than other people or writing with a bigger purple crayon. So there was nothing in my history to suggest that I should be part of that kind of enterprise. But I figured I'd give it a whirl that I'd be a fool not to. All of us who read his work are glad he did. It's a tremendous pleasure to introduce you, David Carr. My name is David Carr, and I'm an alcoholic. I think it's cool that you guys have all these drunks and drug addicts and pirates up here talking. It's the wannabe rockers that were up here. Sam and Nasheen, you killed it. That was like a mic, mic drop. <laughs> Unbelievable. Whoa. Who wants to come up after that? Uh, and you can build my website, by the way. Um, I'm already ahead of the game. I've done one other commencement. It was at NYU, and the riser was about like this one. In an effort to demonstrate my vitality, I thought I would leap up on the riser, and I caught my toe, and I hit my face really, really hard <laughs> in front of about 400 people. And two things about that, it's, it's, it's embarrassing, <laughs> and it's hard to talk when your face hurts that much. <laughs> I had already rehearsed coming up and down the steps a few times, <laughs> but I was still nervous. And then one of your classmates, I won't say which, said, most of you guys are going commando under those gowns. 
and if you're supposed to imagine your audience naked, it kind of calms me. <laughs> Makes me feel safe up here. I'm also very conscious of the fact that if you wanted shimmering pearls of wisdom, great eloquence about the broad sweep of history, you would have picked somebody else. Ed pointed out my credentials include taking seven years to get through college. When I was up for that job in Boston, you know how you always read about people who lied about their resume? And I had to call back to the University of Minnesota and say, I did graduate, didn't I? <laughs> Those are very complicated times back then. Uh, so I have no master's, no PhD, no nothing. I've been to treatment five times. I've been arrested for a variety of mi misdemeanors, one felony. And yet you guys voted me in. I wonder about the vote that put me here, but I think it's a little late for the re uh, recount, and I'm assuming that Rob Ford, the mayor of Toronto, was busy. <laughs> um, so we're in this together, for better or worse, because of your uh, vote. I asked the, uh, the dean for advice, and he said, it's not that big of a deal. He said, don't fall down, I've already, unless I fall down leaving. Uh, stay away from projectile vomiting and try not to swear too much. To which I say, Ed, that's a pretty high fucking bar. <laughs> I don't, I feel like it's just, I'm along for the ride, right? This is so much your day and your day. And I'm, as a father who's got a 17 year old, my, my wife are home doing a garage sale to raise money to uh, go off to, to college. My sympathies are with you guys. <laughs> they are. It's a tremendous sacrifice that brought us here. What a great day for your families. I couldn't be more excited to be up here with you, but it's really your day. Congratulations. Out. I. I reviewed some of the work of the 51 people sitting up here, and it's an honor to call them colleagues. I am stunned by their ambition, their execution, their willingness to load up a tool belt with every manner of storytelling and go forth and bring those to the world. I think the practice of having some old crusty guy come and give you advice is sort of silly. What, what do I really know of your life and your moment? I don't even know half the software that you're working in. Um, things have changed in a fundamental way. Um, we talk a lot about that, but just a quick note. My daughter Erin is um, a video journalist, and um, I spent a lot of time trying to dissuade her from getting involved in our business. She listened carefully and went the other way. You should do the same today. Um, um, but my first story that I did was uh, about police brutality. It was in a little local weekly. About 30,000 people probably saw it. Um, Aaron, same age, 24 years old, went and did a story about a guy who used 3D printers to make, make guns, get around federal gun laws. And I sort of head patted her. I said, that's a cute project. That's a good idea, honey. I think it got 12 million hits on YouTube. <laughs> I'd like to strangle her. <laughs> I'd like to strangle you guys too, but I'm afraid I'm gonna end up working for you, so I'm gonna suck up to you instead. <laughs> <laughs> You're entering, obviously, a changed world where the business model is supposedly on the ropes, but the ability to do journalism, to reach audiences, has never been better. I like your odds, I do. I mean, I care about you, but I don't worry about you. I think you'll be fine. The practice, methods, and varieties of journalism have metastasized. Think of this last year where a lone whistleblower contacted a lone blogger and exposed a massive government intrusion into the lives of Americans. This is an administration that came, out, came into office claiming to be the most transparent in history. Turns out they're addicted to secrets, and we know that because of this work that was done. 
we came to know that the spooks, the national security apparatus, got to this administration, secret drone attacks, secret kill lists, secret prosecutions, and secret trials. Edward Snowden working with Glenn Greenwald, Barton Gelman, and Laura Poitras, pulled back the blankets on all that. Many others, including my colleagues at the New York Times, advanced that story as well, advancing a new line of inquiry and brought light into secret corners. They changed history. I don't know if you guys will, but you have a shot at it. I never did myself. I made a few dents along the way. But you have to aim high. You have to start out. Um, you have to articulate your own ambition. If you're the kind of person who finds the most interesting thing in the world to you is something you don't know, you're probably in the right place. If you're the kind of person who probably reads and watches amazing work, much of it you're by, co by, by your colleagues, you'll probably do that kind of work one day. <clears throat> like this is important. If you're the same kind of if you're the kind of person that can be both scared and courageous at the same time you might end up doing big things. Don't let anybody tell you you should have been involved back in the day, the so-called golden age. Paul's right, it wasn't all that golden. It wasn't, a lot of those stories sucked. <laughs> right now you have access to all known thought about everything you're gonna cover the minute you step up to it. We never had that. We had some guy named Morty who worked in obits. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who might know a little something about a little something. Uh, uh, on top of that, a bunch of old, crusty white guys who looked a lot and talked a lot like me, they decided what the news was. It's not really up to us anymore. It's up to you, it's up to your audience. Deciding what is important, judging by the work that I've seen from you guys is not gonna be a problem. I'll just tell you a little bit about me. Commencement speakers always seem to get around to it. I, w I was at a commencement in Boston yesterday and the commencement speaker had a sizzle reel that went about eight minutes. <laughs> Pretty impressive, really. Um, my story begins when I was fresh out of school and a friend of my father's um, observed an arrest in which two black suspects, I, I lived in Minneapolis, which was sort of a lot of white people eating white food, snow on the ground, so the whole place was white. <laughs> not, very, not very diverse. And the cops were all white, of course. And as, as Minneapolis became a more diverse, and I might add, a more interesting community, um, uh, a kind of siege mentality set in amongst the police. And a friend of my dad's, a white guy, was watching two black suspects get, on, uh, get arrested, and they were handcuffed, they were under control. He didn't know what they had done. <coughs> and the cops continued to thump them after they're already in handcuffs. And if you've ever been in handcuffs, no need of mention names <laughs> to happen here. You can't do much when you got a pair of cuffs on, trust me. Um, so my dad's buddy just stepped up and said, hey, uh, you know, it's Minnesota. Gee, uh, <laughs> golly, you seem to be just still beating the shit out of them while they're <laughs> in handcuffs. So, same thing happened to him, right? That's what happens to people who speak up. And I just said to him, that is outrageous. Somebody should write a story about that. My dad just looked at me and he said, I thought that's what you went to school for. That's why I'm telling you. <laughs> so I obviously already knew where the police station was. I didn't know where the records were kept. I didn't know anything about nothing. It took months, I had no idea what I was doing, but I eventually reported out and sold the story to the local weekly. And it turned out the cops were chronic offenders, that this was a hobby of theirs, state-sponsored violence, 
against other people. They were chronic offenders. They were eventually found out and thrown out. I love that. I most love that when it came out, my name was on the front. I like went around town to all the rats. There I am, there I am, there I am. It was all I could do to not take a pica ruler and measure, how big is my name here? Um, I'll start with that. Somebody should do a story about now that. Now, you know, I woke up today in uh, uh, like an open air. At, what hotel am I at, Ed? We don't know. It's on, is Shattuck Road down there? Okay, so I'm out, out 6.30 in the morning, and I, I'm just, I'm trying to find a, a bagel or something, and it's like this open air mental health ward. <laughs> and I, t I didn't have the suit on. I had like some bad gym shorts and a sweatshirt. Let me tell you, I fit right in. <laughs> But I'm just walking around. I'm not kidding. I didn't get panhandled once. <laughs> Everybody just went, hey, bro, what up? <laughs> um, so those guys are <coughs> down there with nothing, two sticks and a rock and a sleeping bag. De minimis mental health store, uh, services every day trying to make their way. Yeah, somebody should do a story about that. Somebody has and somebody will again, but someone should do a story about that. Um, right now, not that many miles away from us, um, there are <coughs> a whole generation of bright young things just like you, and they're hap helping massive corporations like Google, Twitter, and Facebook figure out how to take our every commercial, every private moment and turn it into a commercial opportunity. As a society, we've traded away our privacy and our independence for a bag full of apps, utilities, and functionalities on the web. Most of the time, the services are free, which means, of course, that we are the product, has been said. Americans need to understand what happens every time they push or send an email, download an app, pick up a cookie while surfing, that when everything is free, there's a hidden cost. And as I said before, someone should do a story about that. Right now, there are people who are spending enormous amounts of time deciding what kind of car to get because they have, they have so much money they don't know where to put it but because it's San Francisco, they don't want to buy a car that's going to make them look like they're rich. Like that's their real problem, is trying to figure out how do they manage the optics of being wealthy. Very young people, very rich people, driving through, as I pointed out, open air mental health wards. I think somebody should do a story about that. Right now in Oakland, there are people who are suspected, watched, and sometimes patted down for what they believe or what they look like. Not what they did. It seems wrong. Stories have been done, but I still think somebody should do a story about that. But that's enough of me as an assignment editor. <laughs> you guys have gotten plenty. Um, all I want from you is world peace, <laughs> economic fairness, and I'm gonna toss in racial decency, so get on that, please. Um, being a journalist, I never feel bad talking to journalism students because it's, 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 it's a grand, grand caper. You know, you get to leave, go talk to strangers, ask them anything, come back, type up their stories, edit the tape. Um, no, that's not going to retire your loans as quickly as it should, and it's not going to turn you into a person who's worried about what kind of car they should buy. But that's kind of as it should be. I mean, it beats working. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd have to get a job, a real one, one, one that, that 
that, that you think of the people who go to work every day sweating hatred for what they do. We skip to work. I still do. It's a gas. So much fun. I got to go to the uh, Supreme Court not that long ago to hear the aerial arguments. I was with my editor. It's, it's all I could do not to hold my editor's hand when we were walking in. <laughs> so great! God! Um, uh, I'm not kidding either. Um, I, and I can tell you the thrill does not go away. What I remember is the crackpots who turned out to be right, the supposed thugs who understood justice better than the cops who were arresting them, the little noted bureaucrat who realized that their bosses were not acting in the public interest. More often than not, it's our sources, as has been pointed out, that show the way. Um, when I was an editor in Washington, D.C., a woman came to me and said, um, you know, I've been gun stalked by this guy for four years. He calls me, he emails me, he shows up at my house. I've called the Washington police over and over, and they won't do anything about it. I said, well, of course, that can't be true. Um, I looked at all the police reports, looked at all her personal information. She was telling me a true story. And of course, somebody sh should do a story about that. And I started thinking about it, and I thought, you know what? It's probably this woman. She's really articulate, really smart, really truthful. So uh, she told an amazing, epic story. One of the conceits of literary journalism, which is caught so well here in practice still all over America, is that we're immersed in certain stories which allow us to reveal greater truths. There's nothing you can be more immersed in than your own story. And so I just tried to give her the pen, and, and, and she told a story that w w was vivid, visceral, and most of all, true. And, but right before it published, um, uh, uh, I thought, well, what's this guy going to do when he reads this story about this woman ridiculing him and going after him for what she's done, what he's done to her life? Is he going to show up at her apartment uh, uh, and, and, and cut her throat as she walks in? Is he going to use the gun he's been walking around? I could see he had a handgun permit. And I just, I got with her, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What, do, what are we doing here? What, have you really thought this through? And I made her bring in her sister. She didn't have a mom and dad. And, 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 and we went over and over uh, the sort of uh, the risk assessment, the threat. And she said, look, somebody needs to tell a story about this guy. I think it's me. So off we went. The guy got hammered and turned himself into police, uh, was convicted for terrorizing this woman's life. I didn't know it was going to uh, turn out that way. She didn't know it was going to turn out that way. But if you tell the truth, generally no harm will come to you. You can work for a website and cover the Oscars. I covered the Oscars for four years, Ed. I just, that hurt when you said that. I just, <laughs> well, say that wounded me. I was on that red carpet. Did a lot of video, a lot of blogging. Apparently, you didn't really check it out. <laughs> Very popular, Ed. <laughs> you heard what Paul said. We're not supposed to be bores. Um, the, but so you can work for a website, you can work for a newspaper, you can uh, 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 sell your things to Frontline, to HBO if you're lucky. Uh, uh, but ultimately, who we work for is the people who tell us our stories. We're to deliver. We're Sherpas. We're bystanders to people's stories. I should tell you, you know, that whole thing you had going for done on your master's project, that fear, that insecurity, you know, the copy won't align, uh, the video stutters, the audio doesn't match, um, uh, the lead sucks, all those things. That stuff never goes away. It just doesn't. And uh, both student speakers talked about always trying to make it a little bit better. That's the whole game. That is the whole thing. And there always is going to be somebody smarter and better than you that should have this job. Like when, when I got here and my luggage came down 
uh, uh, the carousel. And, you know, I see the New York Times uh, 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 business card on, on my luggage. It's just like, that seems weird. I mean, that <laughs> is, as Ed pointed out, that the likes of me would end up working there. And last week, um, uh, you know, New York Times is a very nice place to work most times, but uh, last Wednesday, my boss, who I admire and respect a great deal, Jill Abramson, she got fired in plain sight, just fired. She got replaced by Dean Bacay, who's another journalist that I admire and respect, and is great. And we all just stood there and like, Wow, did, how did our workplace just turn into an episode of Game of Thrones? It's, <laughs> it's like blood everywhere. And as soon, as soon as it started, I got out the notebook, started writing down, turned on the iPhone, started recording. And I'm thinking, well, somebody's going to end up having to do a story about it. And so we all meet and gather afterwards. I thought it was important that we tell this story as best we could from within the New York Times. Um, I was pretty sad that person turned out to be me. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, let me see. I want to do my job, but keep my job. Do my job, keep my job. Um, this morning, uh, 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 but I realized, you know, uh, someone should write a story about that, right? Yeah? And that someone turned out to be me. And this morning, it, 6.30, uh, I write a Monday media column, and my media column is always about the foibles of institutions, how they fail to live up to their goals, how they prat fall in paint, plain sight. Um, and, you know, guess whose turn it is? Monday. So I, I and I'm, I'm like, again, I'm back in that spot this morning. Uh, uh, right, you know, I type for a living. Let's see, do my job, keep my job, do my job, keep my job going back and forth. It's not like somebody's going to step up to me with a gun and blow my brains out, but there could be some hurt feelings if I tell the truth. Um, the thing about doing the story in the first place, I just, by sort of explanation, it was a page one story. I'm good at a couple of things, as Ed, Ed pointed out. I'm not what you call a page one writer. I don't have that great authoritative voice. I'm not a super organized guy. You wouldn't want to see my raw copy. And yet it turned out to be me. I think it's important that, that, that in the end that you rely on, if you think about these projects and your families went and looked at them, it's like, how, how did you do that? How did you do that? And the, 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 the big lie is you didn't really do it. You had a lot of help, right? That you had collaborators, that everybody who touched it made a little bit better. And, That'll never change. The great work is always going to emerge from the spaces in between people. I don't want to take an opportunity of commencing at such an August institution and not throwing down uh, just short bits of advice. I mean, you'd do it if you were up here, wouldn't you? Just a little bit. Um, these are uh, uh, these are 10 bits of graduation advice you won't see on, a, on any BuzzFeed listicle. Um, <coughs> remember my credentials, though. You know, I was on welfare. I was, became dependent on the state for both food and medical treatment. Uh, I became a single parent at a time when no one would trust me with a ficus plant. Um, other than that, I've been sort of a model citizen, so <laughs> just take what applies and leave the rest. That's what I'm saying. Uh, 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 right now, in your class, I know you guys are all having your kumbaya moment, and you're just hugging each other and seeing how great you all are and stuff. But there are gunners. There are people who are really just heads, heads and shoulders above everybody, and they're bound for glory. You know what? They're not the ones that are going to change the world. It's somebody that was underestimated. It's somebody you do not know that's really going to kill it. I'll guarantee you. I'll guarantee you somebody's worked with young people. And you know what? Maybe you're that person, I just want to say. Do, this has been a theme, and I just want to echo it. Do what's in front of you. When you leave school, you got your loans weighing down on you. you got your parents saying, what the hell are you going to do with all this? 
just do what is in front of you. Don't worry about the plot to take over the world. I don't, I don't, just do what is in front of you and do it well. It, the, um, I think that if you, uh, you, you concentrate on your plot to take over the world, you're gonna uh, miss things. Journalism is like hi housekeeping. It's a series of small, discreet acts performed over and over. It's, it's, it, it, it's really the little things that make it better. So don't think about the broad sweep of your journalism. Just do a good job what's, what's in front of you. D working on your grand plan is like shoveling snow that hasn't fallen yet. Just do the next right thing. I think you should be a worker among workers. And, and, and I just say that because we're in this brand of like narcissism and personal brand and they, uh, 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 they, don't, don't worry about branding yourself other than not, not being naked, naked on your social feeds. I, I don't think it's really important for you to like work a lot on brand development. I mean, I, I believe I believe in social media engagement. I've got a little problem with Twitter myself, as Ed pointed out. But uh, it isn't, it's more important that you fit in before you stick out. That's what I'm saying. Um, number five is the mom rule. Don't do anything you couldn't explain to your mom. All these big ethical conundrums, you know, where they, <coughs> you know, <coughs> Ed and me will run a three-day three symposium on ethics, when in fact, if you can't explain what you're up to with your mother without her saying, honey, that seems a little naughty to me, what you're doing. That seems a little bad. That isn't nice. Don't do it, don't go near it. Use the mom rule. Call her up, she's a great resource. Don't just do what you're good at, that's number six. If you stay in your comfort zone, you'll never know what you're capable of. As has been pointed out, you, you need to learn to experience frustration, and you need to experience that frustration as a teachable moment, and you need to humble yourself and ask for help. Can you help me build your webs my website? Yes, you can. Being a journalist is permission for lifetime learning. Don't be a know-it-all. Ask the people around you. Um, Number seven is be present. I don't want to go all Oprah on you, but um, so many people spend time, like their phone right now is just burning a hole in their pocket. What? Who's on there? What are they talking about? And uh, you, know, you, you know what's going on while you're thinking about it? Your whole life, your whole life is going on. Um, I can't tell you the times I've gone to some extraordinary event or some conference where you know, some big throbbing brain is telling you, everybody's walking around like this. They never look up. And it's like, if your head is in your phone, the scenery never changes. So don't, don't, don't worry about documenting the moment. Experience the moment. Uh, um, I, have, I have close to a half a million followers on Twitter, but the person who needs to know what I'm doing is me. Here I stand. This is what I'm doing. Um, you know, I got some pictures earlier. I might tweet them out later, but Twitter isn't waiting to see what I think. I need to experience, you know, the, 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 this extraordinary morning as it unfolds. And maybe later on, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put a photo on Facebook or tweet something out. Look at who you're speaking to. Get your face out of your phone. Do not be a bystander in your own life. You'll miss everything. Um, you should take responsibility for not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff. I have noticed in leadership, in covering people over and over, it's the people who are capable of taking ownership over failure and apologizing very directly for their shortcomings that succeed. We're all broken one way or another. To, expe to expect or pretend otherwise is stupid. And when you come up short, just say so. Don't make excuses. Excuses, they explain everything and they excuse nothing. Just be, just be honest about what you did wrong, take ownership and resolve to do better. I think it's very important, this number nine, just to be honest. This is a tactical approach these days. People, people always say, oh, I love that thing you got where you just like say whatever's on your mind, you just, 
Just come right out with it. It's like, what, what do you, what do you, you know, you, the truth. It's like, well, that's not really a tactic. That's a, that's a way of living. That's a way of being. Uh, when you're honest with someone, when the door opens and you have a difficult conversation, just walk through it. Have the difficult conversation. Show the people in front of you the respect to be honest with them. One of the things I hate about being in California is you guys always, when you talk, you sound like you're agreeing with each other. You're not. You're having, oh, I totally hear what you're saying, and I'm sure we can work with that. <laughs> there needs to be, we obviously got to loop in some other, and it's like, no, you're wrong, I'm right, here's why. <laughs> when you develop this gimmick, this reputation for telling the truth, People tend to listen to what you say. And last part, last thing is don't be afraid to be ambitious. I'm living a pipe dream, and I'm living it because I wanted it. I wanted it really badly. I was 34 years old, washed out of my profession, on welfare, uh, terrible reputation, single parent, and um, I had, uh, I just, uh, met the woman that'd be my wife, and she said, where do you see yourself five years from now? I said, well, I want to be a figure on the national media scene. <laughs> she said, well, honey, uh, you're unemployed and you're on welfare right now, so there's like a middle part. I know, I just, <laughs> just trying to articulate a goal. Um, the other thing I'd say is the people who doubt you like, you're going to get out of here, and you're going to have friends who got their MBA and who are working for Morgan State, wh whoever they're working for. They're working for a hot dot com. And they say, well, it, you know, good luck with that. You're going to sink below the waist. Those people are your friends, the people who doubt you, the people who doubt you, because you're going you're to make fools out of them. And, and I, I often think of the people who never thought I would do anything. Those are your allies. Those are your little secret friends. You keep them close. Um, I think that what's, what's important, I was on a panel with Gay Talese, the great New York Times journalist, great narrative journalist, and he was, he was people were asking him about the current age of journalism where you know, we're Boswells. So we sit in the cube and we write about who people who write about who people who write about. That we end up in this meta, crazy place where we don't have anything re original. We're just putting a little topspin on whatever's going by. And Gay Talese, the great Gay Talese, said, we are outside people. We leave. We find people more interesting than us and we come back and we tell their stories. Right now, everything looks impossible, but think back when you applied to be here. What, I mean, how many bodies did you crawl over to get here, for one thing? You're, you're extraordinary just by getting in here. You, I, I mean, and now you made it to the end, improbably. Not everyone probably did, but you're here. You're standing here. So when, so when you see, you know, the big incline ahead of you, just keep in mind these last two years, you have totally beat the odds and you fucking landed it. Yeah. You're here. Yeah. Odds against you, here you stand. Grads of the Berkeley School of Journalism. Be resolved to be worthy of that. Resolve to do important things with that. Be grateful for the good things that have come your way. This small group before you, ladies and gentlemen, will, I'm sure, one day make a big dent in this world. Maybe somebody should write a story about that. My, <laughs> please, my, my deepest congratulations to you, the family, you, the faculty, but most of all, you guys, I, I'm, I'm proud of you, and I don't even know you.